Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. I'm very excited to be joined by Dr. John Giordano, who's the founder and lead faculty guide of Semester for Change, which is something that he just founded recently, which we're going to talk about. He's got a really interesting background, and you're going to hear about all of that. But before we do any of that, I'd just like to welcome you to the show, John. So welcome to Trending in Education. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great. It's great to have you here. You're someone who's had a long uh, and varied history in education, uh, bridging K-12 and higher ed and thinking about the future and now recently founding something uh, new. Can you give us some of your origin story? What got you to this point in your uh, professional life? I studied uh, visual art and art history as an undergraduate and graduated from college. Like so many young graduates trying to figure out what my next step was and just worked for about a year. And in the summer after I graduated, I happened to stumble across an article in the New York Times that was speaking of Governor's School of the Arts that was taking place at Rutgers University. Hmm. And I was not very happy in my, my job at the time. So I tracked down the director of the program and I called and said, hey, do you happen to be looking for anybody else for the summer? And it turns out that the person who was supposed to assist in a, a painting class was not able to attend. Long story short, they hired me that day and I became a teaching assistant in a painting class. This is a really great program because it, it introduced high school students who were invited by their high schools to attend a summer program on a college campus. So it gave mm -hmm. them sort of ideas about college. And I remember after the first day in the classroom, the professor who I worked with was very, really gracious and said, co-teach, just if you don't feel like you're only assisting me, mm -hmm. jump right in. And I didn't really know what that meant because I didn't know really how to teach at all. Right. But I just walked around the room and talked to students about their work. And after the first day, I said, oh, I think I've just found my thing. I just knew I loved teaching. From that point forward, I found ways to connect making visual art, being an artist to teaching art. And I decided to go to graduate school to get a degree in art teaching. And at the last minute, got cold feet and decided that I really thought if I'm going to be a good teacher, I needed to be an expert in my field. So I delayed a year and got an MFA and started teaching college level courses here and there, picking up a class like many people do when they first get out of their MFA programs. A friend of mine who I knew from graduate art history courses from a master's program was running a museum education program at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, where I was living. And uh, this friend said, hey, I want you to run this program for me. It's really exciting. It's a program where high school students are trained to give tours of really challenging contemporary art exhibitions for their peers. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, I'm teaching college. I don't know about that. But she was so persuasive, I took the job. And I loved it. It was really quite quite an amazing four years where I was running this program. So not only did my high school students, who happened to be one of the most diverse groups of students I've ever taught, become incredibly skilled at understanding contemporary art and sharing the strategies and motivations and aesthetics of contemporary artists to groups of their peers, but they just became incredible critical thinkers. And I found that because there was such diversity in this group of students, that some of them were on their way to college, had really great support in college counseling, and others were first-generation, potential first-generation college students who had very little by way of access to right. higher ed. So I built in college counseling into this program on the side. It wasn't even mm -hmm. central to the program. And our students started getting into just absolutely phenomenal schools, mostly because of their incredible backgrounds and their efforts. But I think our program helped them maybe get that boost that they needed to be accepted right. uh, to certain schools. Long story short, I started developing more community-based arts programs for, for K-12 groups and worked in a number of bridge programs that introduced early college courses or early college programs that introduced college courses to high school students and really found that I was developing a niche as this bridge program person who... Yep had one foot in higher ed and one foot in K-12, mm -hmm. and went on to teach in an art college for about a decade, where my role was to work with people who wanted to teach, but didn't necessarily wanted to get certified and teach in K-12 public, uh, 
schools. Yep. So my students were people who enjoyed working in community-based organizations, uh, youth serving organizations, hospital settings, anything other than schools, museums, uh, especially. And it was interesting because some of them saw themselves as art art teachers. Some of them saw themselves as activists or arts administrators. I didn't really feel it was important that they found a particular label, right? The work was very interdisciplinary and I was a likely person to teach them was because of my interdisciplinary background. After about a decade, I found myself feeling like I needed to fill back up. I was feeling really depleted and I decided to get a PhD in interdisciplinary studies. Mm -hmm. My dissertation looked at the role of artists as agents of social change, particularly artists who had either put aside their own studio art making, or in addition to their studio art making, were catalyzing conversations with community groups in order for community groups to work through social issues of concern Mm -hmm. to them. So I kept teaching visual arts, interdisciplinary humanities and community engagement courses, Mm -hmm. and eventually landed a a two-year position working in a bridge program in a college in the Boston area where I was working with students who were underprepared academically but showed promise and needed additional work to really get them on on college level. This program was really interdisciplinary. It combined psychology, human development, philosophy, literature, the visual arts, and a lot of work on academic skill building and critical thinking and paper writing. And I I really loved it. And at about that time, I decided to go back to part-time teaching and I started Ramp Education, a consultancy that focused on helping high school students and their families through that transition from high school to college or alternatives to college. And so fast forward a couple of more years, and I found myself picking up college classes as much as I wanted at the time. Ramp was becoming full-time by last year, but I was still teaching a lot of college courses too. And I got myself in the spring semester of 2020, where I was running ramp full-time and teaching full-time and thinking, Mm -hmm. oh, I can do this. This is fine. I'll just have to really pay attention and just keep all the balls in the air. And then COVID happened. That was interesting because I found that nothing made sense anymore. Everything was turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And I had to end up putting two out of my three courses online in about five days. Students' textbooks were locked in their dorm rooms. They couldn't even get their textbooks after spring break. And I had to rewrite the entire curriculum. I've likened the spring of 2020 to when you see the stampede in the Serengeti. It's like suddenly everyone had to go (laughs) online and not every wildebeest made it across the, the watering hole. But it sounds like you made it through the, those trials, but it was a very difficult year. And it was very transformative for you on, on a personal level. That's right. And I, I was determined to get my students over the line. I didn't want them to get caught up in the stampede. And I was mm-hmm. really amazed that most of them were determined. Some of them really struggled. And actually some who struggled in the classroom setting did better online and other ones who did great in the classroom setting struggled online. So it was really difficult to gauge who was doing well and who wasn't, Mm -hmm. but everybody was clearly stunned, including me, (laughs) (laughs) along with a lot of other professors. But anyway, when it was over in May, I said, okay, we're going to have a lot of students who are struggling now, right? Who are probably on shaky ground already and are now feeling really blown off course by this kind of disruption. They didn't expect to not know if going back to school meant being fully online or if they were even gonna be able to be on their campus or if being on their campus meant being told to stay in your dorm room and limit your social engagement. So I thought some students are gonna wanna pause college or need to, or in a position Mm -hmm. that they just don't even know why they're there. Yeah, we've talked about that as the corona gap year, where uh, a lot of folks were thinking about gap years before, and then if there were ever a reason to take a gap year to just do that pause and that reset and reflection, 2020 certainly prompted that, certainly among some families and and undergraduates, but also uh, to your point, I think a lot of us have just been forced to reflect a lot more and rethink should we take the traditional path or should we explore ourselves and look at some other alternatives? I think that's right. And I am the kind of person that looks for opportunity. So I said, as as difficult as this time has been, what is the opportunity here? And it seemed that I've long been trying to work on higher ed reform inside the system, trying to improve systems and really try to help students connect to themselves and to really connect their interests and figure out their purpose Mm -hmm. early in the process. But it it does feel a lot of the time like 
trying to turn a battleship. And right. COVID, the waters were rough enough. It, it created a kind of turbulence that I felt, all right, now is an opportunity to really try to do something different. Mm -hmm. So Semester for Change was born and we, we enrolled our first cohort in the fall and we're about to enroll our second cohort this February. Yeah, congratulations. And what exactly is Semester for Change? Semester for Change is a program where students work with me and my associate, Monica Ram, who was actually a former graduate student of mine who has a really deep background in academic advising, social justice education, and working with first-generation college students with non-traditional backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So I think between my more traditional background and her, a more non-traditional background, we were a pretty good team in terms of wanting to present a program where students would take a, a two hour a week course online called Designing Your Life, which is founded on uh, design thinking principles. And the idea is to see your life as a creative project and try to work through ways to think about your future in terms that really connect you into your interests and give you an opportunity to develop a project. Mm -hmm. So in addition to this course, which we call it a course, but it doesn't really feel like a college course. And while there is some outside work, it is not arduous in the sense that many courses are. It's much more about a personal self-exploration mm -hmm. than it is about pleasing professors and fulfilling a curriculum. But what that course does is it initiates a process where you develop a project. And the project can be something quite modest or quite extensive. It really depends on where the student is. But the idea is to take an interest farther than you've taken it before. So perhaps you have an interest in photography and you want to do a series of work and have an exhibition of that series. Or you have an idea for a business that you want to sketch out and try a pilot for. Or you want to start a blog or record an album on SoundCloud. Yeah, or start or a podcast maybe. Start a podcast. That is definitely an idea and we would definitely support that. And what we would do is I would say, hey, I know this guy named Mike Palmer. Maybe he'll <laughs> talk to you and give you a, a few minutes of his time. So we connect students to resources and say, talk to these folks about what they're up to. Mm -hmm. Because this is another thing we do. We have college students taking courses but we don't have them testing and prototyping. And one thing that's amazing about the design thinking process is that you try things out, right? Through the, this process, when the student is developing their project, we're getting them connected to resources. Mm -hmm. And then when we start thinking forward, what's the next step for you? Is it going back to college? Is it taking more time off from school? Do you want to bypass college altogether and go straight for a career? Again, what we do is we have these life design conversations where we connect people out to people who can share their life experiences and give them a better sense of what it means to go into a particular kind of profession. Yeah. Um, the program is very advising focused. So in addition to the two hours of synchronous class per week, they're meeting with their faculty guide at least one hour a week. And if they wanna meet more, we can schedule in a second hour. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of individual time where there's working through your project, there's talking about the future, there's talking about if you go back to school, what's your strategy? So we really think broadly yeah. it, of what takes place in these advising sessions. And then the final part of the program is an e-portfolio, like electronic portfolio where the students are using an electronic space as a research space, a, a thinking space, a design space, where they're collecting ideas and then also reflecting on how their experience in the program is going. And by reflecting and setting goals and recording those goals, they're able to keep themselves accountable. Mm -hmm. But then all these four components, the course, the project, the advising, and the portfolio all start to weave back in, into each other because you can bring ideas from how you're laying out your goals in your portfolio, you're bringing that into your advising session or mm -hmm. the ideas from the advising session influence the project, which is recorded in the portfolio. The idea is for it to be very organic and iterative in the sense that the different aspects of the program are all informing the other. Yeah. So no, the I idea is to go through a personal transformation process with this project as yeah, at the center. Yeah. I really like the idea of applying the design thinking to your own life and uh, career path. And uh, can you give some examples of 
what you've experienced with students? I think everybody's coming in with a completely different education a history of, as a student and are having different college experiences. So I think first and foremost, it's about providing them a very custom experience grounded in their own lives. I would say that one thing that I, I learned very quickly is that while I believe very strongly that the project is a really good idea, because I don't think we give young people enough space to see something through themselves. Everything is given, a structure is given to them. Really think it's important for them to find that structure for themselves with the support of others. I do think that we have to be very mindful of the fact that some people are just more equipped to go further than others. And that, that the best thing to do is help somebody find that, that spot for themselves that really works. Yeah. So some participants have scaled projects back, some have enlarged them. You have to know almost intuitively how to suggest what direction you would suggest that they go in, if they yeah. should push themselves further. But we've had participants, one participant in particular who comes to mind, who both faculty guides really encourage, hey, let's go once to do another draft of that. Go. This person was actually developing a blog. Mm -hmm. kept saying, write more, write that again. Let's see another draft. Let's see another draft. What is, are you saying all that you believe you can say about that? And they had never been pushed that way, like mm -hmm. th that hard in such a supportive way before. And I think they broke ground because of that. And I think part of that was just getting rid of the traditional classroom expectations, the course expectations around fulfilling credits. Yeah. And also being evaluated as opposed to, I, I like the, the collaborative co-creation approach that you're describing. Do you have any insight or thoughts on the types of skills that educators need to be effective in this uh, guide on the side orientation? Yeah, because design thinking is the core, right? Pedagogical ground foundation for the program. I think it's the sort of thinking that artists do in terms of pivots and flexibility, making novel turns and trusting that those novel turns are of value. And if they're not, you just go back and you figure you take another step. Failure, we talk about failing forward in the program, that mm -hmm. failure is a part of the learning process. And again, I can't tell you how many students are so afraid of failing. Mm -hmm. And especially with, I think, a generation of parents who have swept conflict out of the way or swept yes. failure out of the way for their students, people don't know how to fail well. So we really focus a lot on that. And artists are really great you know, at failure, but they're also really great at saying, what do I do with that mess right. I made right. and moving forward? Mm -hmm. So I think adaptation and flexibility are really core ideas and novelty and intuiting the next step, like how you would counsel someone to consider a step forward and then just working with them, staying with them, yeah. developing trust with them, an advisor, a faculty guide becomes someone to be a collaborator, like to be a co-creator, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, so it becomes a creative process, I think, on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. And it reminds me of a lot of the trends we've seen around uh, social emotional learning and building psychological safety and uh, a foundation of trust. Do you have any experiences in this challenging year around delivering those softer components of your course through online as opposed to face-to-face. -to -face. Do you have any perspective on some of the challenges you faced and what you may have learned over the past year? One thing that I'm interested in is because I've had a foot in higher ed and in K-12, I've long been interested in the way that K-12 pedagogy comes up to higher ed and higher ed pedagogy comes down to K-12. And one thing we're seeing more of, I think, in K-12 today is social emotional learning, and character development, mm -hmm. uh, character traits, et cetera. Yeah. And I think there's some really positive things about that. There are aspects of it that I, I have concerns over, sure. but I do think we aren't talking enough about the social emotional development of college students. And I, I do think that's very important. In terms of creating a space, the idea is to create a really non-judgmental space where because we're removing traditional assessment out of it, and while the faculty, clearly, I would never try to say there isn't a power dynamic, right? Where it's like you're a faculty member, they're paying you to attend the program. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a power difference. But I think it's a lot less than in most kinds of classrooms. Right? Yeah, yeah. So some kind of emotional trust does develop because I think they, the student realizes how much 
the faculty guides really care about their progress. And I've had college students who said, you know my name, like most of my professors don't know my name. And I think mm. we just have to absolutely, like we just can't move forward with yeah. that kind of way of thinking about what higher ed is. Because if you don't know a person's name, then you're never gonna understand where they are emotionally. I think faculty do have to be much more clued into how students are actually doing. Yeah, I frequently quote Whitney Houston when I say, I get social emotional baby. You, have, you may not have heard uh, that I, before, but I'm renowned. <laughs> Or a bursting into song. The related piece, I think, is just understanding the future of work, which is something that we talk a lot about on this show in, in many different capacities, whether it's lifelong learning or what's happening in the new economy skills that are emerging around data science, cybersecurity, all these other things. But, but as someone who's had that window into both K-12 and higher ed and has been coaching folks who are going through that very difficult transition into adult life. How is your thinking about the future of work impacted or affected how you've designed your program? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that the, the great challenge is, let's say if someone comes in as a freshman and they say they want to be XYZ major, but we're not even sure what the jobs in that field will look like five years after they graduate, say like bio bioengineering or computer science or even business or even more sort of social science fields. I think there's always just incredible changes going on globally that suggest that we should probably be either less focused on teaching specific skills in a field or at least accompany those skills with a way of thinking and working. So collaborative work in teams that is predicated on flexibility and adaptation, right? Mm -hmm. If you can create adaptive thinkers, then you can rely less on skills and more on the way people go about the, their ethos for work, their ethos mm -hmm. for working with others. And I'd like to think that the world is heading in the direction of a more just and embracing diversity in the world. And that means people being empathic to the way other people think and yeah. seeing the way they think as something that can be integrated with other people's sensibilities. One of the core ideas of design thinking is empathizing with a problem, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, in a design problem, that'd be how do we create a better computer mouse or right, track, right. trackpad? But in, in terms of your own life, it's how do you empathize with the choices that you have, right? And the path that you've been on, your life experience, and how do you gain greater empathy with regard to yourself and others. Mm -hmm. if I, I have a friend who works for Oracle who said that they'd much rather hire a history major or a philosophy major than somebody out of computer science or even business because they know that person's a good critical thinker and they can teach them the business. We have to teach better thinking. And I think that is creative. In terms of where the future is going, the creative thinking is at the, at the center of that. Yeah, absolutely. And you were mentioning before the the mindsets that are necessary. I think frequently we gravitate to skills because they're very granular and you can describe them, but frequently there needs a needs to be a shift at a at a more fundamental level. A growth mindset's the one that we talk about a lot, but a lot of design thinking is mindset based. And a lot of the, the shifts that we're looking for, I think are in many ways around a maker's mindset. Can you talk about that from your perspective? Because it yeah. does sound like you've been building things throughout your career. And then you've also been helping others think of themselves as makers and maybe get some yeah. self-efficacy by seeing what they can build. Yeah. A maker space is the perfect metaphor for, it's almost like the, the program is a conceptual maker space. And I'd love to think if we ever get to the point where we can start working face-to-face -face again without all these restrictions, I'd love to see a Semester for Change become a sort of maker space that's somewhere between an art studio, a, a design studio, an engineering lab, and a library commons all rolled into one. Ultimately, I think the idea is this maker mentality is that you are always faced with a set of problems and that you can use, like you, you mentioned growth mindset. I think that's perfect. I think there's a and deep connection between growth mindset and uh, design thinking in that the idea is, oh, okay, so this problem is in front of me. What do I do with it? Right? Like people with growth mindset, according to Carol Dweck, are, are the kind of people that say, I'm not going to be set back by that. I'm going to use that, the, the difficulty of this problem to forge 
you know, a way forward. Mm -hmm. And, and so they see challenges as opportunities. I think every artist does. So if we can help younger, you know, students, high school, college students start to see the world as an interesting challenge that's Mm -hmm. full of frustrations and setbacks. And at the same time, full of creative possibility and all also see their lives that same way. And I, I think they might actually feel a little less anxious. I think anxiety and depression are at almost epidemic levels. I think a lot of it is because people do not feel a, a the sort of autonomy that is grounded in a kind of a connection to oneself as a right. creative being that is, is growing all the time, mm-hmm. but also a, a kind of autonomy. This might sound contradictory, but I don't think it is a kind of autonomy that is grounding in in support, right? In connection to others, but the right kind of connection, a kind of connection that actually empowers you and gives you more agency rather than dependence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I was also struck by you mentioning earlier, learning from a novel turn and forcing yourself to almost deal with uncertainty, deal with novelty and new new environments, new situations. Is that something you're, you're modeling as well in terms of the, the design of the program? Are you learning? Are you, it seems like there are ways in which you are almost more experimental than traditional higher ed in the methodology and approach that you're using. Can you talk about how to apply that sort of creative mindset to designing a learning program? Yeah, I've always been really interested in experimental education, the experimental college movement, Black Mountain College is a a really big influence on me. I'm definitely informed by sort of this idea that if you can bring people together who are curious, you might even forget that you're actually in a class, (laughs) in a school, just because you're so involved yeah. you're so you're so engaged that you lose the whole sort of rhetoric of learning and mm-hmm. rather than thinking about it you're doing it so i think experimentation is really core to making that happen and that there's just a lot of baggage our k12 and our higher ed system are really codified in many right. ways right and crisis like we've gone through this past year as really difficult as it's been mm-hmm. it does start to loosen up those institutions in a way that yeah. can create inroads for experimentation. I'm really interested in the micro college idea. I think that we're seeing these micro colleges pop up. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very much related to uh, social movements. After the late 60s and 70s, you saw a lot of utopian ideas pop up, whether they were intentional communities or educational institutions. The idea somehow in the wake of that conflict people feel empowered to say, hey, we can try new ideas. So I'd like to think that this is the beginning of that. I still Mm -hmm. think in some ways, semester for change as an online experience right now is limited, but this is what we have. And if this is the environment we're we're forced to be in, then I don't want to wait around and say, we'll get to something once COVID's figured out. I want to work in that space and see where it can go. Where before I was limited to working with students only in the Boston area, now I can have students participate from anywhere. There are some advantages to that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, as an experimenter, as an artist, every day I say, what's the next step for this? Where's this going? How are we gonna move this? What's not working? What is working? And how is this program gonna keep evolving? And the great thing about running it on 12 week semesters is you can keep iterating new tweaks as it goes along. Yeah, So it's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the, also the notion of getting comfortable with the discomfort, which is something that many of us have been reflecting on over the past year, whether it's uh, some of the social justice issues or, or racial inequities and whatnot. I think many of us are leaning in. I like to lean into the awkwardness of those conversations uh, rather than avoid them. In many ways, that seems reminiscent of the artist's sensibility, which, which I, I really love the connection of that to charting your own career path. As we're getting closer to time, I just want to make sure folks, if they want to learn more about uh, Semester for Change, where should they go? You can uh, visit our website at semesterforchange.org. You'll see a program description, a little background on on us, as well as an application right on the website. Or you can uh, submit an inquiry on the website and we'll get back to you. Awesome. And who is it designed for? Who who do you think is is this uh, really best suited for? We want it to be very inclusive. We've had students who are just feeling that 
the college is not working for them right now and they're feeling quite lost and they're really looking to get back on track, whether that means staying in school or leaving school. Yeah. So it's people who are really in a space of uncertainty mm -hmm. and are feeling disillusioned about school, mm -hmm. but also people who are taking intentional breaks and want to realize that they really are invested in school and find that it's just not optimal to be in school with all these restrictions right now. So they'd right. rather take a break and still grow and work on a project that's interesting to them. So there's a really a range of people who are getting involved. Mm -hmm. But I would say if somebody's feeling as if they're not sure they're going to get that as much out of a semester as they want, mm -hmm. or they're questioning what, why expend so much money in college when you're not sure what you want to study, yeah. this is a great opportunity to hit pause and focus on those things. And like I said, we talk about things like interest and passion and purpose very critically mm -hmm. because I think ultimately we're putting a whole lot of pressure on young people to, we're asking high school students, what's your passion? What's your passion? And the right. truth is pa passion comes from work. Passion comes from trying things. Right. So the whole idea is to give people a, 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 a productive space where they feel supported in trying things out. Yeah, that's awesome. And before we let you go, John, we always love to ask our guests, what else that you're noticing out in the world is capturing your imagination? Any trends emerging? Anything that for us to keep our eyes out for beyond what we've talked about so far? Is there anything else you wanted to share? Anything else you're noticing out there in the world? I'm paying very close attention to what we're calling Gen Z. I think they're really an interesting generation. We see a lot of thought leaders coming out of this generation. Right. And that's great. And all the power to people like that. I'd like to help people who maybe aren't quite out there on the vanguard feel right. more confident mm -hmm. to get moving and create change for themselves or change in the world that matters to them. But I think it's a fascinating generation. I think they're very aware and I hate to see their college experience or these particular years in their lives kind of thwarted by the pandemic. I would say if there's one thing that's interesting to me right now, the emerging identity of a generation that has experienced a crisis in the way the generations you know, haven't for quite a few, for maybe uh, at least a half century or almost a century. I'll be very interested in seeing who this generation is, and I'd like to be a part of helping them you know, find their way. Yeah, and that's maybe a call to action uh, for all of us to, to maybe step outside of our own generation and think about how we can give something back uh, as well. Because it, it does, this pandemic did hit many of us in different ways, depending on where we are in our lives. And if you think back to where you were when you were 18 or 20, trying to sort things out, and if you were to layer on top of that the pandemic and the upheaval that we're seeing around Black Lives Matter and uh, the political unrest and the polarization that we're seeing. Folks do need a supportive mentor, uh, a Sherpa, if you will. And it sounds like that's part of what, uh, what you're trying to do at uh, Semester for Change. We might have to change the uh, you know, faculty Sherpas, we're gonna have to call ourselves. <laughs> Dr. John Giordano, it's wonderful having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot, Mike, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And for our listeners, if you like what you're hearing, tell a friend, subscribe, share the love, pay it forward, do all the good things. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education.